welcoming for a fireside chat, Christopher Bishop and Harry Shum. Great. Harry, first of all, thanks hugely for taking the time to join us. I know you've had, a, you've had an incredibly busy day. Yeah. In just, uh, I guess you've literally just flown back into Seattle. So t tell us what you've been right. to today. Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations, uh, Chris, and you know, both uh, for the incredible lab you have built over 20 years in Cambridge. And of course, you know, uh, it's nothing beats the, this great honor of the Royal Society signing on the same book as Newton. Uh, it's an incredible achievement. <coughs> I just came back about two hours ago. Uh, I was uh, this morning uh, at this big Microsoft internal event we call the Ready. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually a week-long event for our sales force. Uh, half of our company, uh, roughly half of our company is actually working uh, on the sales and marketing side. Every year we use this opportunity uh, to share with our field, the sales force, what's happening in the company. And we also live broadcast the, the, all those presentations from uh, uh, the, the conference and across the company. It happens to be in Vegas. It's only 114 degrees there. Uh, it's, just, <laughs> uh, it's just incredible. I hardly went outside. And, uh, so I was so happy to come back to join uh, you and the faculty summit. That's great you could yeah. be here. So um, what I thought we'd do to have maybe 20 minutes or so, you and I having a bit of a yeah. chat about AI. And, uh, and then after that, we'll open it up to the audience. So please uh, you know, be thinking of some interesting questions on the topic of AI for Harry. Um, but maybe I can just dive right in. And I'm going to start with a fairly tough question, because this, <laughs> this is a bit like asking parents about their favorite child or something. But uh, I mean, there's a lot of work in MSR worldwide around AI. But are there any things that particularly stand out for you right now? <laughs> oh, that's really a tough one. And I guess if I can take this one, the rest will be easy. <laughs> Um, it's just so many exciting things going on in MSR. You know, I feel extremely fortunate and very proud of what we have done in the last 26 years in MSR. Um, they, they are actually three areas uh, I recently um, I'm very excited about it. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, you would agree that AI is certainly one of them. I, I get to that later. Uh, two other areas I feel very, very excited about. You know, uh, one is actually very forward-looking. The other one is also very, uh, very timely. Uh, the one very forward-looking is quantum computing. Uh, we have been working on uh, the Station Q, uh, quantum computing for a long, long time. Uh, I think we're getting to a point that you know, we, 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 we feel we are getting very close to get the, the stable you know, qubits that, that we can produce. Uh, certainly, you know, Mike Friedman will be able to tell you a lot more details. Uh, one thing I can, can share with you is that you know, we feel so confident that we actually started to really work with experimental physicists to really get to the physics level, how can we really construct those qubits. Uh, once you get enough of those qubits, then the great things can happen. The other area I feel very, very excited about and very timely for my Microsoft is on security and the privacy. Uh, specifically on security, uh, this incredible initiative you know, across all our labs, certainly you know, you know, Cambridge Lab as well, is on this, uh, 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 what we call the confidential computing and the secure computing. Uh, the idea there is that really you know, not only you can do encryption you know, at rest and on the go, but also during computation. So this has been a very exciting uh, research area for us over quite a few years. It's fantastic to see we have an opportunity to move those technologies into Microsoft products. Um, certainly, well, I want that's to. That's very relevant for AI, of course. Absolutely. It's so data driven, and we care about data exactly. privacy and security. So. Yeah, it has profound impact in the, uh, uh, over many, many things that we want to do at Microsoft. And in AI, of course, there are many things that we do. Uh, um, I heard Eric give a fantastic presentation this morning, and uh, I had a, the opportunity to uh, go through his slides earlier. Uh, we do many things, and uh, 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 I'm not going to talk uh, about a lot of things that Eric mentioned about. I just, just bring a couple of examples that where I see great MSR research having incredible impact on the products. You know, one of those areas is actually uh, machine reading. Uh, the, the, a lot of interesting things happening in natural language, and uh, we as a company deal with a lot of text, you know, whether it's email, web page, or even any kind of documents. Uh, there's so much that we can do. Uh, we're ab ab absolutely working hard on that. Um, Office, Office 365, Outlook, you know, Word, and many of those things 
uh, we depend on a lot of MSR technology along this line. Uh, we loosely call the machine machine reading comprehension. The other area is actually uh, probably a little bit of personal bias is really the, the, the connection uh, between the visual images, videos, and the natural language description. Uh, sometimes people call it the you know, captions, captions from image, you know, captions from video. Uh, I think true you know, image understanding uh, has to be connected with natural language. Mm. Of course, you're giving a keynote, aren't you, next, next week, is it? At, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, this Sunday. This Sunday. <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing. I was invited to <coughs> go give a keynote at the CVPR, which used to be my main conference mm. uh, until 2007. I believe 2007 was the last time I really participated at the CVPR. Uh, this time I got an, a chance to go uh, uh, attend again and uh, give a keynote, you know, mostly really about you know, sharing some lessons we have learned uh, from Microsoft. Uh, the title of my talk is called Commercializing Computer Vision. So I will talk about uh, a few examples, uh, including HoloLens, uh, how we actually organize research efforts, how we actually do move the research from, to the product side and uh, with the flywheel. That's great. Actually, yeah. that's a good, a good hook into my next question, which is um, sort of step back a little bit. And uh, a few months ago, the company created this new organization, AI&R, <laughs> and uh, appointed you as the leader of this. So um, can you tell us a little bit about AI&R and, and its mission? Yeah. Well, I, I am incredibly excited about and very honored to have this opportunity to lead AI&R for Microsoft. Uh, AI&R is actually our... Uh, uh, force uh, engineering division and the research division. And the R is research. In case uh, R is research, yeah. AI, and the research. Uh, the, the other three parts of engineering groups, in case you don't know and are curious, uh, those three are windows and devices, uh, office productivity, and uh, uh, clouds and enterprise. Uh, AI and the research is the fourth one, and the latest and the smallest one, actually. Uh, we only have 7,500 people in our division. So. Uh, <laughs> But it's very timely and important for the company, as you see you know, the, the incredible uh, progress has been made uh, in the last several years, in particular in AI. Many areas of AI, uh, the, the, many of those great examples this morning from uh, Eric, you, know, uh, you already seen. But we, we feel this is really the right time to um, not only do great research, but also really having impact on Microsoft business, first of all, through products and the services and the opportunities to really democratize AI technology to third parties to our customers. So that is the, the really starting point. And the, the recently I had the opportunity, have had a lot of opportunities talking to many people outside of Microsoft as well, including many CEOs, CTOs, and engineering leaders. Everyone is just so, excited about AI and also so worried that, you know, what if we miss this AI thing? I think there's certainly a lot of hype over there. My joke is that, you know, you have to claim that you like and you do AI, uh, artificial intelligence, because the opposite of artificial intelligence uh, is natural stupidity. <laughs> so you, you just have to say it, you know, if you don't do AI, what else did you do? So that's the problem. And, uh, uh, but the seriously, on a serious note, uh, we, we really believe there are great opportunities mm. for the company and for our customers, even more importantly. And anything in particular, any particular products or services that you see coming along? Yeah, I'd be happy to share more. In the, so the way we think about with the AI and the research division uh, is really about you know, what kind of uh, really products and services that we can offer. So by and large, we think about you know, three lines of products that we build. The first one is really the first party AI products that you probably feel um, you know, you know, reasonable. Um, along the line of say, you know, search engine Bing and the digital assistants like a Cortana. Uh, I certainly you know, very much believe in that the, the ultimate form of AI um, is actually in uh, digital assistants in the right place, right time, with right information. Um, helping you uh, to do right things, um, still very, very early. Uh, along that line, we actually do very good work uh, on chatbots. So we have been building chatbots uh, uh, like no one else, and especially we start from China, uh, great success with Xiaowai, then we were doing Rina in Japan, uh, Zoe in the United States, 
and uh, um, within rule uh, in India. So we will continue to expand our effort. So this is one line of products that we feel uh, very committed in the long term, we we'll keep pushing. The second line of products, um, uh, also very reasonable for Microsoft take on, is what we call infusing AI into every single product and service Microsoft offers, especially with Office. Uh, imagine you know, that with PowerPoint, you know, we already embedded you know, machine translation to PowerPoint. You know, when you do PowerPoint presentation, the audience, depending on the, 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 what kind of languages they like, they can actually tune into that language. Uh, another thing we actually incorporated into uh, PowerPoint is actually uh, image caption. So now when you import an image into PowerPoint, you know, immediately we can offer you uh, image captions if we feel confident. If we're not confident after analyzing the picture, uh, we might be confident enough to show you some entities detected from the image. So it's still very early, uh, uh, but with PowerPoint, we actually every day we actually have 10 million uh, images that actually uh, uh, get captioned. And we also you know, have you know, Word, PowerPoint, and many other things that we can do. Uh, the grid work from your lab, for example, you know, uh, with Excel, you know, what we are doing when, as you import data into various cells, you know, what kind of things we can process there using some machine learning and AI tech. So that's really second line of work that we do. And uh, I should also mention about really applying AI you know, into our cloud. Uh, Azure is becoming the most intelligent cloud, uh, literally, you know, as if you look at what kind of AI capabilities we can offer there. The third line of uh, our products uh, that is, I would say is pretty new and uh, um, is something that I have thought of long and hard and have decided that we'll have to take that on. It's really the new and the emerging business processes. Uh, as we think about you know, all different kind of verticals and all different vertical industries and all different kind of horizontal business processes, uh, I certainly believe that they will all be disrupted by AI and the data. Uh, the, the vertical um, industries like health, healthcare, you know, something you, Peter, and the, uh, uh, Chris Jones in, that have been working on, um, it's just so obvious that we should get in and you know, you know, apply our AI technology. You know, the challenge is that in what way and with what business model and how should we think about the partnership. And as we think about the horizontals, you know, maybe it's even more interesting. You know, all the business processes we actually uh, deal with today, like sales and the marketing, like uh, customer support and uh, customer services, like HR and the recruiting, all those things uh, will be transformed. It's just so obvious, so obvious should be in everyone's mind. Now you actually have data. Now you actually can do the process. Now you can apply AI. So those things, in my mind, uh, will be low-hanging fruits, you know, so to speak. Uh, if you care about uh, 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 creating a new business. Mm -hmm. So those three directions are what we now focus on uh, in Microsoft, uh, especially for AI and R. But it's really not just us. You know, we, we work together with other parts of the company. Mm -hmm. That's great. An amazing time to be in the field. Yeah, absolutely. So much, uh, so absolutely. Much yeah. Let me ask you a little bit about um, you know, Microsoft in particular. And how, how would you say that... Uh, Microsoft's approach to AI perhaps differs from those of others. What makes Microsoft special when it comes to AI? Well, Chris, I would start uh, by asking a slightly more general question that, you know, what is uh, you know, the special about Microsoft? I think every company uh, has its own culture, has its own mission, uh, has its own point of view. You know, why should we even exist? You know, Satya, you know, was very clear that we should always question ourselves. What would people miss if we simply just disappear as a company? Uh, I think we are very, very clear that we exist to serve other people and other companies. Our company mission statement is, is incredibly you know, crisp, in my opinion. That's empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Uh, now with AI, so that is the, really the high-level guiding principle. So, so do that with AI. And the, more specifically, I would say, if you look at you know, our position, our assets, you know, our history, uh, I think we approach AI you know, both you know, the, the, with a very practical approach, yet uh, with long-term commitment. Uh, I start with long-term commitment. So we started Microsoft Research 26 years ago. Uh, at that time, you know, Bill Gates said, 
wow, wouldn't that be nice? You know, someday computers uh, could uh, see, hear, uh, talk, and understand human beings. You know, what is that? You know, those computers are called AIs. So uh, most people don't know that among the first groups we ever started in the Redmond lab, that's the first lab we ever started, uh, the first three groups were natural language group, uh, speech group, and the computer vision group. Uh, so we started that you know, 26 years ago, you know, anticipating you know, you know, AI will make a greater progress, you know, general AI, and you know, we we'll work towards general AI. Um, we definitely continue to have this commitment and the confidence. We continue to invest in research, uh, really take on those very tough problems, you know, the uh, question that you always want to address, and the Eric, Sue, and the many others you know, care about. We continue to push that. Yet at the same time, I would say, we do have those products that can infuse AI to immediately help our customers. I, I already mentioned about you know, PowerPoint. I already mentioned about you know, you know, cloud uh, you can, and also Excel. You can imagine that the you know, world will become more intelligent. You know, world should become a really writing tool, much more intelligent than today. Uh, even more interesting to me, you know, my favorite application nowadays of AI is actually Outlook. Uh, there's really no reason why Outlook search is so difficult, and a smart reply is not very smart, and the reminders are not very intelligent. All those things now, we, AI, are, work together with office teams you know, very, very closely. So, so I would say that, you know, we, first of all, we have our own you know, company's mission you know, that you know, really guides our AI work and then we are both practical in the long term. That sounds great. So, um, so lots of opportunities then for AI. What about, um, what about the other side? What about the risks associated? I mean, do you, do you wake up at 3 a.m. worried about killer robots and lasers <laughs> and that sort of, or what, what do, you, what, do you see any risks in AI? I, 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 I do <laughs> if I uh, don't worry about those products. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there are many things that we should you know, worry about in there, uh, uh, but I'm not too worried about in the, the things like super intelligence, and they are, uh, but they are practical things we do need to worry about, in my opinion. The first thing I would say uh, probably is you know, whatever AI applied to the physical world. Uh, you know, a concrete example is actually self-driving cars. Uh, I would predict that the most challenging time uh, would be when half of those cars on the street are self-driving and half of them are still human driving. I don't think we really understand enough yet. I think, uh, I think we are fooling ourselves just saying you know, today you know, autonomous driving is already there. Uh, it, it's just going to take some time. I, I, I learned something just a couple of weeks ago at the uh, MIT advisory board meeting. Uh, Ronnie Brooks was there talking about the robotics and the, the, the inevitably one of the topics there was actually self-driving and the, he, if I understand in his point of view, he's actually um, very cautious about how soon we, we see autonomous driving cars there. Uh, his kind of argument is straightforward. He said, look, if you drive in Cambridge, Boston, the, the fake Cambridge, not the real one, so <laughs> if you drive in Cambridge, um, you really couldn't drive if you don't violate the traffic laws. <laughs> now, now how, how, did you, how did you program into that? And I think that is something that you know, we're still learning. It's still very, very early. And the direction is very clear. It's just about the staging. The other thing you know, we, we as a company, as in the industry, uh, worry about is the, the, the profound impact with AI, with automation, uh, that we will see um, on the job market. Uh, I think you know, every technology disruption, every dis that technology innovation will have certain impacts. But this time, I think people tend to believe uh, this thing uh, is probably going to be more real than, than others. Uh, we don't understand that, you know, what kind of new jobs you know, it will open up. Uh, we already see uh, 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 some jobs who, you know, will be transformed. So, so those are the things that actually we, we worry about as a company. And uh, maybe the last thing I personally you know, worry about AI, not much about super, super intelligence. It's really that you know, the, the reason AI is so so different from many other incredible you know, innovations in the history of human being is that most of the previous innovations, there's much about 
extending human physical capability. And this time with AI, we're talking about extending brain power as well. Yet, we don't really understand the human brains. And the neuroscience is still, in my opinion, still very much in you know, the early stage. Uh, so something that you know, we, we keep learning. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think actually also there's a, there's sort of a risk the other way. There's a yeah. risk of things that may not go as well as we hope. But I, I wonder also that with um, you know, very justifiable concerns about, about the data, about privacy, security, that's and so right. on, that we might um, go too far in the other direction. And then actually, I mean, particularly interested in the healthcare space, yeah. for instance, there's tremendous societal benefit that we can see is, is potential, is latent there in AI. And that's right. And we may shut that out if, mm -hmm. we, if we overreact to some yeah. of these risks. So it feels like we need to find the right sort of middle ground here. Right. I think the, the uh, one small step toward that, first of all, I, I totally agree with you uh, uh, on that. A very small step step you know, towards that, you know, we have been learning you know, through the development of many you know, AI products, especially through our chatbots, is really um, this whole AI thing is not just about you know, pure IQ intelligence. You know, it has a lot, what it's all about, that is about smart. It's actually more about empathy and understanding, you know, just like humans, like EQ. So it's something that you know, we still learn, you know, what does this even mean? And uh, when you interact with a human being, you know, uh, uh, you know, when did you make this kind of recommendation? When did you interrupt? And, uh, a lot of the things, I think it's still very, very early. You know, my favorite, exam favorite example is actually, I was talking to the Xiao Ice team in Beijing. And the, the chatbot knows where this person is, you know, roughly through IP and others. And it's, let's just say that it's already you know, 1, 1 a.m. in the morning, and this person keeps talking to the chatbot. So should chatbot slow down the response? Should chatbot say, oh, you should go back to, to sleep? Now, what if it's already 2 a.m.? What if it's actually 3 a.m.? You know, does, chatbot, does the chatbot have any responsibility? So those things, we, we, we just, we just, just very, very early. You know? so, so we just have to really learn you know, along the way you know, how to design this kind of AI products. Yeah, it's really interesting, and uh, and of course it needs input from lots of different disciplines, right? Not just yes. from you know IT technologists yeah. and uh, you know social scientists and right. uh, many many others. Um, I'm conscious of the time. I'm keen to open this up to questions, but there's just one more question. I just okay. I think uh, I'd like to touch on because I know this is of tremendous interest, not just to Microsoft or the whole IT industry, but to industry generally, and of course the academic world which is this um, extraordinary explosion we've seen in demand for talent in this space. <laughs> and uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts on the talent pipeline and what, what we could do? Well, it's truly amazing to see you know, how excited people are about AI, you know, first of all, then you know, how hungry you know, you know, the companies are hiring AI talents. You know, the, the, we all know that you know, just the, the price tag is just the, you know, sky, sky high. Um, not too long ago, I was at a, at a forum. I said uh, to the press, I said, look, you know, nowadays, uh, if a young kid knows how to train five layers of neural net, you know, the kid can absolutely demand six figures. <laughs> if the kid can train you know, 50 layers of neural net, the kid probably will want you know, seven figures. So it's just that the, the talent market is very, very hot out there. I think this is the, the, where we should work together with academia to train the next generation of AI talents. You know, you know, students really know, you know what to do, what kind of tools uh, they can do. At the same time, uh, Microsoft, companies like Microsoft you know, uh, have responsibilities to come up with the right tools. You know, in Microsoft, we certainly do. We actually build two kinds of tools. You know, one is actually for developers. The other one is actually for data scientists. Uh, in data, for data scientists, we have Azure Machine Learning go all the way end to end, how we train those models and tune those models. For developers, we have you know, cognitive service APIs. And uh, uh, we should do even better you know, coming up with Visual Studio type of tools and so that you know, we can actually help you, you know, put together a project and debug the, the whole process and uh, then compile that and you know, take all kind of you know, you know, framework to compile together all the way to different kind of running platforms uh, uh, like you know, uh, Azure, Azure with GPU, or even your home machine, or even to uh, Raspberry Pi. So those things, I think, we have responsibility. Uh, maybe last thing I can share with the audience is that you know, we as a company, of course, struggle uh, to train our own AI talents. 
uh, so much so uh, I decided to uh, start a, an AI school uh, several months ago. It turns out to be a huge success. I know everyone wants to learn AI, and of course we want to train every you know, engineer, developer to become an AI engineer. Uh, would love to uh, learn from you uh, the best of practices and uh, even partner together. Yeah, great. Thanks, Harry. It's fantastic. So let, let's open it up to questions. We have various um, roving mics. So just put your hand up. Um, somebody will give you a microphone, and uh, uh, we have somebody here. So, yep, number three. Hi, uh, Julia Hockema, University of Illinois. Um, I was just wondering whether you could um, expand a little bit more on what you see the role of academia to be and what we can do as, um, yeah, as faculty. Well, that, that's, a, that's a big question. That, <clears throat> um, the, the way we look at that is Microsoft Research has had a you know, very rich history of uh, collaborating uh, with many universities and uh, many university professors. Uh, I feel you know, uh, very honored that you know, many of you uh, choose to come to visit us uh, at this time and uh, coming to uh, faculty summit to have a chance that we can exchange ideas. Uh, then we figured out things, uh, even more things that we can work together. Uh, for Microsoft and especially for Microsoft Research, you know, we, we're very open. You know, we, we do a lot of, a lot of projects and we write a lot of papers. Many of those papers we jointly uh, uh, do with the professors and the students. Uh, I, 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 I don't really have anything that specific say, you know, in general, you know, how professors should work with us or work with others. I think everyone has a different situation. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, Chris, you want to add something. I know you, yeah. you do things very successfully, like work with some universities in Europe, like a recent announcement with Amsterdam yep, might be a great week. example you can share. Yeah, sure. So I think this collaboration with the academic world is a, is a very deep one and incredibly important. And I, I like to think that it's mutually beneficial. Um, as Harry mentioned, just last week we announced another collaboration. This is with Max Welling, the University of Amsterdam. And there are really sort of two threads to this. One is around this talent pipeline. So really trying to partner with academia, because I think it's in everybody's interest that we really have a strong talent pipeline with the next generation of AI researchers coming along. So one of the things we do with Amsterdam, but actually more generally across Europe, is we, we fund uh, actually a very large number of PhD students. But we don't just fund the students. I think more importantly, we actually, almost all of those students are co-supervised by researchers in MSR. And so it's a way of sort of adding some intellectual horsepower that, that augments that available in the universities and also helps the students get a little bit of a more of an industrial perspective as well to complement the academic perspective. And then, so that's one strand. And then the other strand is on the research side, where we're looking at some of the, the really cutting edge, the futuristic, the very long-term aspects of things around machine learning and AI, where we, we see really complementary strengths, in the case of the University of Amsterdam, real uh, tremendous strength in areas around unsupervised learning and rich probabilistic models, combining probabilistic methods with deep learning, looking at things like causal discovery from data, and, and sure, we have expertise in MSR in those areas, but, but you know, this is a vast and very active field, and we can't do everything on our own. And so these partnerships are in, incredibly beneficial. So I think those two things, both the, the talent pipeline and also the, uh, the research collaboration, just incredibly important to us. Yeah. Uh, who's next? OK, yes, number two. If you just give us your name and affiliation as well, that would be fantastic, thanks. Hi, I'm Barbara Gross from Harvard. So you can tell by my gray hair that in a few <laughs> decades, I'm going to retire. And the advice for people retiring is to diversify their portfolio. So I see that you're making a really heavy investment in deep learning. You can also tell from my gray hair that I've been in AI for even more decades than MSR has existed. Um, and I've, <laughs> I've seen these trends where <laughs> there's one technique that's everything. And I, I, deep learning has done great things. But I'm wondering how diversified you see your portfolio of AI being <laughs> both in terms of the research and in terms of your school. Well, you can, well, listen to my talk tomorrow. That's part of the answer. I'll, I'll get, let Harry <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you finish your answer first, so then I will come to yours. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, uh, so, you know, deep learning has been a, a, un undoubtedly a breakthrough. So the, there are things that we now do at much with much higher levels of performance than we did before. And I think probably that breakthrough in deep learning has really re rejuvenated the whole field. 
real. And in some sense, the reason we're excited about AI is because of that. However, the idea that everything can be solved by just shoveling label data through a deep neural network will, of course, be completely naive. I mean, it's, uh, so I think it's in, it injects a lot of energy and enthusiasm into the field, which is fantastic. I also think that it offers a, a, a new building block that we can combine with other techniques and that can amplify those other techniques and can, can advance the whole field. But it's certainly not on its own a complete solution to all the things we want to achieve. So, so yes, I'm, I'll be giving a talk tomorrow, a keynote, which, uh, which I'll talk about some, uh, a somewhat broader perspective on machine learning that hopefully will help answer the question. I, I add a little bit. Well, first of all, uh, Barbara, welcome to Microsoft again, and uh, we love you. You should come to visit us more often. And uh, Eric always talks about you and uh, and send more students to us. And uh, <laughs> the, 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 I I really think that you know we first of all should thank Deep Learning you know, you know for its incredible contribution and the impact in the field of AI and a uh, lot of excitement you know because of the Deep Learning. In certain areas, uh, it actually worked beautifully in the speech recognition, vision recognition, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, other things like deep reinforcement learning. Uh, I don't think people are naive that you know, thinking just that deep learning is going to solve every problem, and I don't think you know, people uh, feel that way. But until we actually can build the tools that incorporate a lot of you know, interesting deep learning models to a way that you know, millions and millions of developers, engineers can easily do that. It's just like solving second order you know, differential equation or whatever. Uh, I think that until then, and the people will still be mystified you know, what this deep learning really is and uh, what's, what's, what's really going on. I, I hope that you know, we, you know, in the next few years, you know, we'll be able to contribute you know, with great tools coming from Microsoft. Uh, if you really look at what's happening in, 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 in deep learning, uh, a lot of those efforts has been really on the kind of architecture design of the deep neural nets that actually can perform better than others. And then, uh, then you think about you know, the really deep intellectual contributions coming out of the field. Uh, they do have something like you know, generative ad adversarial networks and you know, a few things like that. I'd love to see even more. I think we, 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 maybe we should do more deep learning research and we see you know, if we see more coming out of that. But still, you have to go back to those fundamentals. Many of those things you know, Eric talked about, we certainly diversify uh, in MSR AI, the areas that we focus on, uh, get to the, the deep understanding of what is intelligence, you know, what is cognition, you know, how did you really build the models. Um, so that's what we do here. Great, fantastic. Uh, who's next? Uh, in the back. Right at the f in the far corner at the back is somebody. <laughs> okay, number three. Hi, David Carger, MIT. Um, so, uh, what's been striking me uh, today in a lot of the presentations um, is how a lot of the work that's going on in AI is about uh, getting computers to do things that. Uh, like reading or having a conversation uh, that even relatively untrained humans are actually quite good at. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, I mean, we, we, we know the, the downsides of that for, for the future of work and things like that, but I wonder if you could talk a little about ways that AI might complement uh, humans and empower them to do things that they can't do as opposed to replacing things that they're already pretty good at. Maybe I started, in the, in the, in the, Chris, you can add more. And the, so the, uh, I, I'm, thank you very much, David. And the, uh, I hate to use this marketing slogan, but that's the marketing slogan we use at Microsoft when we talk about, talk about the Microsoft AI. We say Microsoft AI is all about amplifying human ingenuity. It's really about you know, adding more value uh, to humans. We talk about, it's all about, the reason we actually do Microsoft AI is about the man and machine partnership, uh, something that you know, Chris, uh, Eric, and others from MSR have helped you know, the, our CEO, our senior leadership team to really frame you know, what we really do there. I think there are numerous examples where um, that AI adds value there. I'll give you a very trivial example that you know, I just showed this morning and at our uh, internal event this morning at Vegas is actually this uh, intelligent camera app. 
Um, so something we actually released uh, about a year ago is called the Microsoft Pix. It's an, it, it's an intelligent camera app. Uh, it has a lot of lot of interesting technologies there. In fact, we use the 20 some papers, you know, coming from MSR and uh, uh, put all those text there. But I'll give you one example that is actually, you now if you use this app, you take a picture of anyone, I guarantee you, your eyes will be open. So is this a reasonable example? You know, so <laughs> how did you guarantee when you take a picture of someone and you know, this person's eye, eyes are always open? So, and it turns out that you know, we have already have had a, you know, this, this kind of computer vision, machine learning techniques there. The way you do that is you really you know, take a, a longer sequence. You know, typically we take 10 frames and the, the chances are you are not going to blink that long. So. <laughs> A human can, <laughs> if, if you take 10 pictures, then a human can go through it and find the one with the eyes open. Well, I think it's debatable. I think, Chris, you should add something you have been thinking about in the man-machine partnership, you know, how we think about this at Microsoft. Sure. I think, first of all, this idea of artificial intelligence uh, being a field in which you, you list all the capabilities of humans and then you cross them off one at a time. We achieved human parity in X, in Y, and Z. Very dystopian, depressing. What happens when you get to the bottom of the list? You know, that's, a, that's very unappealing. The other general thought is that... Um, uh, it's true today, and it's going to be true for at least as far ahead as I can foresee, that the capabilities of machines are very different and complementary to the capabilities of people. And we know that when you combine things with different, you know, when you combine two classifiers together with decorrelated errors, the performance of the two together exceeds that of either alone. If you look at, uh, you know, chess playing uh, machines, they can beat humans, but actually the human and machine together can beat any human or any machine, okay, the centaur uh, model. I think that's true very generally. So to, to give you a very concrete and sort of very near-term example of uh, a project which was actually in the, in the, in the tech showcase was, uh, is the project called Inner Eye. So with there what we're doing is helping uh, radiation oncologists do radiation therapy planning. Now it's a big deal because half of us, uh, half, uh, half of all of us are going to end up with some form of cancer during our lives. That's and of depressing. Those, that's kind of depressing. And of those, half of those are going to need radiation therapy. So it's a very big deal. Uh, but, uh, but to have radiation therapy, you, you fire radiation in from multiple angles. You, the idea is to dump as much energy into the tumor as possible, as little energy into good tissue as possible, and especially into vital organs. So you need a three-dimensional segmentation of the tumor and a three-dimensional segmentation of sort of vital organs, eyes, and whatever else might be. Um, that's something which is currently done manually by uh, oncologists looking through MRI scans slice by slice and segmenting them. It's tedious, it's slow, the oncologist gets kind of tired and it's not so reproducible. It's screaming out for, for using machine learning. That's exactly what, uh, that's exactly what the, the inner eye project does. It's not trying to replace the oncologist, it's trying to say, look, here's a segmentation. Instead of taking a half an hour, an hour, three hours in some cases, you know, in a few seconds it gives the oncologist segmentation, they can add then their expertise and say, actually, you know, it's not bad, but actually I can refine it and tweak it a little bit using their experience, and in a few minutes they've got a good segmentation. And it frees up their time to be doing things they should be doing, which is thinking more qualitatively about the whole care pathway, interacting with the patient. And I don't know how things are in, in the US, probably fairly similar. In the UK, we're facing a shortfall of around 4,000 radiologists. And so we're really screaming out for technologies which can uh, empower those radiologists and make them more efficient and more effective, effectively freeing up the stuff that, that the machines are good at and leaving people to do the, the things that they're good at. So I, I see this complementarity as intellectually much more appealing, but also actually something of an imperative. Um, shall we just, we're kind of running out of time, let's just take one more question. Who gets the microphone first? Number two, okay. If you look, uh, Pedro Can you give Mingus, us your name and, uh, sorry, name and affiliation? Pedro Domingos, University of Washington. So uh, if you look at what's happened with technology and business in the last couple hundred years, every time a major new technology comes along, it leads to a, to a new kind of dominant business. So, you know, like in the second half of the 19th century, it was the railways. And then, you know, when Ford invented, the, you know, the assembly line, that was a whole new kind of business. And, you know, like multinationals were the product of telecoms and their travel and whatnot. And AI surely is one such major new technology. So the question is, what is the business what is the new kind of business that is going to result from AI? 
How is it going to be different from, from the businesses that exist today, and, and how do we get there? Well, I can uh, give it a try, you know, at least to share some of the things that we have been thinking about, uh, uh, Pedro. The one, one key thing you know, along this line of you know, AI you know, creating all the business, uh, until, now, uh, until now, people do believe that the magic, <laughs> the magic is in the data. So you have to have data to make interesting things. That, that could change you know, in, in the future, but this is where we see that. So people do worry about that. Uh, is this, does this mean that only the big five, you know, the top companies actually you know, uh, have opportunities, the rich gets richer, you know, all this kind of thing. Uh, at Microsoft, especially in MSR, you know, we have been thinking about this thing you know, we, was together with some economists that we have been thinking about this. One particular angle we're actually thinking about is uh, what we call the data as labor. So that might be one very interesting way to think about uh, the future uh, as a society, as the economy, the business model. You know, what does this really even mean? You know, because if you think about that, you know, especially you know, I was educated by uh, my colleague, General Lanier, you know, if this whole ML thing is going to really dominate, you know, will that be doomsday? You know, there's nothing you know, for humans to do. You know, that's, so we don't believe that is the case. You know, or you, know, you really think that you know, there could be that the humans can continue to contribute, especially the lower part of the society and the income-wise, you know, what, what can they really contribute to society and what should be the future future work you know for those people. So I think that that's one particular you know, you know, direction that we actually think about. It does, does it doesn't really mean just say, you know, you know, we're coming up with a new company with one particular business model, monopolize everything and making most of the money. It's actually more thinking for the whole society. Great, thank you very much. Um, well, we really are definitely well out of time there. So um, I know there are more questions, but I think we should probably wrap there so we can all get off and enjoy our nice dinner. But um, you know, many, many interesting questions. And uh, the, whatever happens over the next few years is clearly going to be an extremely interesting time for the field of AI. Um, I'm going to invite Sandy back to make a few closing comments. Before I do, could I just ask you to join me uh, in thanking Harry for a fascinating discussion? Thank you.